Peace and blessings, family. This is your brother, Asar Imhotep, with the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology. This is the Mbongi, and today is Tuesday, May the 24th, 2022. And we have a very, very special guest with us, Mr. Vince Robinson. As you all know, this week is Cleveland All-Stars Week. And I've had an opportunity to uh, meet with uh, a, a couple of local big giants out in the Cleveland, Ohio area, uh, coming from Detroit for the One Africa Power and Unity Conference and decided we gonna we, we had to have a conversation with all of them. So we started off the week with our good brother, Kevin Hurd, uh, a.k.a. MC Chill. And today we have brother Vince Robinson, uh, who is a musician, a talk show radio host, and someone who was in to the the culture and the arts and and black history and we're going to get into all that and more when we return in just a second each and every one of you for joining us today. As you can see, I'm, I'm not at home or outside anywhere normally. You know, my my work has me traveling uh, through the day. So when I schedule these shows, I, I find a location and stop. But it's just a little bit too noisy. I'm hearing all kinds of construction on one end, the lawnmowers on the other end, and so, you know, I just hopped in the car, so we're going to get the, the, the car interview today. So, but either way it goes, I'm glad that you are joining us live, especially those of you who are on Twitter and those of you who are on Facebook. And, of course, we are on YouTube. And so, you know, just to, you know, inform you of others who will be interviewing this week, uh, we have with us Sister Ladosha Wright who is now added to her list of accomplishments. She is, is building her bag of wisdom. She is a documentarian, a beautician, a, uh, an entrepreneur uh, who has her own uh, hair care line, as well as an author. And matter of fact, I think I have... You know, let me, I got random stuff in the vehicle. I think I have her book with me in the vehicle. Yep, two of them. So she has the text, what they don't tell you at the hair salon. It's time for a new conversation about hair, which you can see right here. And she also has a children's book on hair, The Curly Hair Adventures. Uh, and this one's illustrated by Larry Tinsley. So it's full color. And, you know, your your children, your young little people will love this. So we'll be talking about this, you know, her documentary on hair, you know, uh, Cleveland and the like. And before her, and that's going to be at 8 p.m. And then, um, but earlier at 6 p.m., we're going to have uh, the the president and CEO of uh, the Karamu Theater. And uh, his name is Tony uh, Sias. And this is the oldest, uh, if I understand correctly, the oldest running 
uh, African-American theater, you know, in the country. And so we'll, we'll learn uh, uh, more about him and what he's done and, and the like. So, you no, know, everybody hailing from uh, Cleveland, Ohio. And so there's a lot of uh, talent. There is a lot of history. There's just a lot of things going on out there. And so, you know, I'm where, where we at. And so uh, just letting y'all know about that. And so without further ado, we're, we're going to keep this all-star uh, show going. And so I am honored and privileged to be, uh, excuse me, to have him on our program. And I have been on his program uh, for, for several reasons. And, you know, it's just an honor to have him with us today. So peace and blessings, uh, brother, brother Vince. How are you today? I'm excellent. And, and I'm honored to be in the company of the folks that you just mentioned. Uh, brother Tony is doing some great things with, with Karamu House. And it is the oldest black uh, theatrical uh, entity in the country. So great things there. Uh, Sister Ladosha, she is all the things that you said, and she's also an educator. She's also an activist. She's very politically active, and she's doing whatever she can to support the, the hair care industry and her connection to it. Uh, she developed a curriculum about hair care for the country of Gambia. I mean, there's just so many things that you could say about all these folks. Uh, Brother Chill, a uh, phenomenal brother doing a lot of things. It's because of him, actually, that I know about you. So, uh, mm -hmm. again, I'm, I'm just honored to be here. And uh, one thing that you didn't mention is that I'm an author, too. I have a book of poetry oh, that's okay. out. And, and I have another Indeed. book that, that's in the work. So uh, I aspire to, to do exactly what you're doing. And lastly, <laughs> I want to compliment you on your intro. That that visual that you put up to begin the show, that's absolutely yeah. amazing, man. You you know you gonna have to take me under your wing, bro, so I can grow up and fly <laughs> like you. <laughs> no, no, I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Well, uh, first and foremost, you know, uh, let us know a little bit about you. This is your first time on the program, and so you know, I don't know if you were born and raised in Ohio, but you know, where are you? where you from from, you know, uh, what was life like growing up in Ohio and, and what brought you to what you do currently. And then we'll get on what your, what your future plans are and the like. So the floor is yours. Okay. Well, the easiest question to, to answer in terms of what brought me to where I am now is just my understanding of my purpose in life. Uh, I don't know that it necessarily took me a long time to figure it out, but my purpose in life is communication. So most mm -hmm. of the things that I do involve communication on some level or another. Uh, I'm not typical of folks who live in Cleveland in that I have grown up literally around the world. Uh, my father is uh, an Air Force veteran uh, who transitioned yeah. eight years ago, but uh, in the process of his life, uh, I got to live in different parts of the country and outside of the country. I was actually born in Utah, a place mm -hmm. that I haven't been back to since I was born. But I was born on an Air Force base near Ogden, Utah. Uh, we moved from Utah to Washington, D.C., to the Philippines, lived in Savannah, Georgia, Dover, Delaware, Maslin, Ohio, Naha, Okinawa, Japan, Atwater and Merced, California, moved back to Maslin, and then after uh, my three years at Washington High School in Maslin, Ohio, I graduated and I attended Kent State University for five years. Uh, Kent State is an, an integral part of, of my evolution because it was there that I became involved in um, Pan-African Studies, and uh, I actually graduated with enough credit in Pan-African Studies for a double major, but because my major was telecommunications, uh, communications in general, uh, I had a concern that I wouldn't get hired by that television station if I, if I walked in there with a degree in Pan-African Studies because they wouldn't be ready for me. 
So, <laughs> so, uh, but that that in a nutshell is, is the life. Uh, after um, Kent State University, I worked in radio at uh, WHLO Radio in Akron for 10 months. And then when that job came to an end because they changed the format, I ended up moving to Cleveland and I've been in Cleveland since 1981. So I am a Clevelander. I claim Cleveland, but I can't authentically say that I'm from Cleveland. I understand that completely. I'm I'm kind of in a similar boat. And so I was born in Florida, in, in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and then my younger brother was born there two years later. So a little bit after that, then we started, you know, kind of moving around because both my parents are in the Navy. So, you know, uh, having both parents in the military, when they were stationed places, of course, uh, you know, the kids uh, follow. And so, so, but, you know, I'm in Philly now and been here for like 10 years or so. And, um, and so, you know, I, I have my two main places that I claim is Houston and, and, and Philly, but I've lived, you know, a variety of places. So I can, I could just imagine, you know, what that, what that traveling and seeing different people and and circumstances and how that kind of adds to a a more well-rounded perspective and then on top of that you have in that pan-african studies uh in in history there and and so you know what 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 has all this meant to you you know what have you gained what kind of insights have have you been able to reflect on that many may not have that perspective because of your unique, you know, uh, history and travels and things uh, that, well, that you would like to let us know? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that being able to travel does for you is it exposes you to cultures unlike yours. Hmm. You know, many people, for instance, here in Cleveland, some folks have been on the east side of Cleveland and have never gone to the west side for any hmm. reason. You know, some people don't. They don't go past the, 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 the borders or the perimeters of their own neighborhood. So how could they possibly know how other people live, what's important to them, what their cultural aspects are? So having been able to be in places like the Philippines and observe how people live and to get the smells and the sights and all of those kinds of things, uh, being in a country like Japan and seeing how they live and seeing how they react to you because they've never seen you before. It just gives you a different perspective. You know, you mm -hmm. know, as a result of having those experiences that there's something special about you mm -hmm. that people would want to, to touch you and to, to hear you and to feel you and all that. So it just expands your perception and, and it gives you a different perspective of life other than what you know from day to day. Indeed. And so, you know, I, I want to go back to Kent State for a moment. And so, you know, it, it's not, you would hope that uh, more of us were into our history and culture, uh, but that's not necessarily the case. So my question is, what drew you to take those courses enough that you could double major you know in it so it'd be different if you like you just had to take one or two classes but you know uh that's that's a lot that you can double major in terms of the the, the coursework so what was what drew you to that that field of study and interest i think it was really a matter of self-discovery you know when i was in high school i'll never forget this i was in history class and uh, I had looked through the book. We had to read the book because it was our coursework. But I'm looking through this book and I don't see us in it. So mm -hmm. I asked the teacher, I said, well, you know, I know about Dr. Martin Luther King and I know that black people were slaves. But what else were we doing? What else was going on? And it's not there. So I had a compelling reason to find out more about us as a people. So in my English class, I actually wrote a paper about enslavement, about uh, reconstruction and about emancipation. 
And so I approached my history teacher and I said, hey, I got this, this paper from an English class. I'd like to present it to the class. And my, my statement to the class was, I've learned about your history all year long. Now it's time for you to learn about mine. <laughs> so when I got to Kent State and I had this opportunity to learn about African-American people and Africans, and make the connection between Africa and here, you know, it was just all this knowledge that that came into my headspace. And, you know, the, the coursework in the Department of Pan-African Studies was very diverse. So, you know, it really gave me an opportunity to expand my skill set. So I took one class and it opened up the door to photography for me. So now I'm a full time, full service photographer. Mm -hmm. uh, I took a class with Mwatabu Okanta, who at the time was a graduate student, and I was in his very first class. The brother said, man, you a poet. I'm like, really? And I took him seriously. So that was the beginning of me being a poet. While I was there in that, that institution, I also got into theatrical production. So I participated in plays. So I got to do some acting. I got to be a poet. Uh, I wrote a piece for a class it was called Towards a Black Aesthetic. And um, the instructor had us to write a paper on the black attitude of mind. Well, instead of writing an essay, I wrote a poem. And the poem that I wrote ended up being delivered before an address by Dick Gregory in the Kent State Student Center Ballroom. Hmm. I did that poem and I got an A on it, by the way. But I did a I did that poem and that poem was my coming of age moment in life. That's when I stepped into my manhood because before that I was just a freshman on campus and you know what it's like to be a freshman. <laughs> you know, you Indeed. ain't getting no you ain't getting no play as a freshman because you know the, the girls they want the upperclassmen. They want the cats that are into the frats and all of that. And that wasn't me. But I did that poem and now all of a sudden I'm getting respect, I'm getting play. It's like, "Oh, okay. So I stepped into my manhood. So, you know, I can attribute my evolution and my growth to my involvement at, at uh, Kent State in the Department of Pan-African Studies. And I was privileged to study with Fela Sawande, who was a Yoruba chief. And I remember this was a philosophy class. We'd, we'd be in that class and he would ask questions. And, you know, I was, I was verbal because I'm a communicator and, you know, because of the quality of education that I received as a military dependent, I, I'm not being braggadocious or anything, but I know that the level of education that I received through my experience was a much greater uh, level of, of education than, than many of my, my counterparts, because I used to look at my classmates' work and I could see uh. that they were having issues with language. They were having issues with grasping what was given to them. But the class was deep, man. I mean, I would walk out of that classroom and my head would be hurting because he posed a question that I just could not wrap my mind around. But it, it enabled me to step into a greater level of understanding about life, you know, and I'm getting it directly from an African source. And it's waking up the African in me. You know, Okanta mm. would say, and others have said, you know, I'm not, I'm an African, not because I was born on the continent of Africa. I'm an African because Africa was born in me. So what I'm doing is I'm waking up to the African in me. And I have the benefit of a curriculum that's designed to educe that because that's what education is. It's bringing mm -hmm. out of someone what is already there. And I'm a, I'm a, uh, Mute my cam and mic for a second as I move to another area. Uh, okay. But I'm so I'm listening to you. So I'm I'm here. Okay, uh, and I, but, I have to do something real quick because I got a pot yeah. of oatmeal on the stove and it's burning up right now. <laughs> I so just turn it off. All right, no problem, no problem. Okay, and I can still hear you. All righty, yes, because I I, I want to get uh more on the that specific class that you were taking you know with the the professor because i i've had a couple of uh uh i took this philosophy this african philosophy course by a by an african 
who went to who was actually teaching at Rice University in Houston. And um, but he 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 taught a class at U of H where I went. And uh, so you get some different kind of insights. So I, w- I want to tap into that. Oh, it looked like it went out for a second. Did you hear me? Yes. Yeah, it went out for a few. Uh, are you there? Yeah, I'm it. here. Someone let me know in the comments. Hello? Hello? Yeah, so hold on. I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a come right back. I can see you moving now, so I don't know what was what happened. It's just the the connection went blank. But yeah, so I'm asking, you know, if you can give us a little bit more insight into that specific class and some of the things that you that you learned that that sticks with you to this day. I know that was a while ago, but um, uh, from the from the the professor the uh, who happens to be. A, a a chief in Europe. Yeah, you know, it, it was 40 years ago, or maybe even a, a few <laughs> more than that. So it's it's really difficult for me to go back that far. But some of the things that kind of stood out to me uh was about the evolution of uh humanity. Uh I remember that there was conversation about the seven root races of man. And there was a whole idea of Atlantis and Lemuria and the inundation of the earth underwater and and the way things kind of rolled out. I I remember uh, one of his quotes and he was just talking about how people repeat the cast off thoughts of others without really fully understanding what they are repeating. So there were there were a few things that that I retained from that class. But as I was saying, you know, some of it was just so deep, it was just hard to to digest. Um, There are some things that he wrote that I would like to get my hands on. I think Brother Chill may have a copy of uh, some of the things that he wrote, but there were just certain things that were lessons for students to know as they go through their education process. And I would really like to get back to them because there are gems and nuggets in them. But, you know, basically what I got from uh, uh, Fela Sawande was just the the whole idea of embracing who we are as Africans and, and understanding uh, the value of our history and culture. You know, I remember he talked about um, wanting to understand something. And if you want to understand a tree, for example, you don't just look at it from one angle. You walk around the tree to get a complete view of the tree. And he he talked about um, certain aspects of spirituality. You know, you don't just cut down the tree. You ask permission to cut down the tree because the tree is a living thing, you know, and you have to honor and revere those things. So as I look around and I see how the Amazon rainforest is being devastated and I can look around just where I am right now and see sometimes how they just clear out things and they just cut stuff down just for the sake of doing it or maybe doing landscaping for whatever reason. But I know in my mind and in my heart that they didn't have a conversation with the ancestors or the creator or or any spiritual thing before they did it. They just saw that you know, they wanted to take it down and so they took it down. So, you know, one of the greatest takeaways that I have about that class is just having a reverence for life and having an understanding or reverence for the unseen. Because, you know, the what we see is only 90 percent or it's only 10 percent of what's actually there or less. You know, there's so much more that's not seen than is seen. And we're kind of pushed towards 
the, some of the tangible things that we deal with. But, you know, our lack of understanding of what we don't see is what creates so much of the dysfunction and the discomfort that we experience in life because we're not connected to it. One of the greatest things that we can do in life is to connect with our inner self because within our inner self, that's where we access that, that divine. We access the creative energy that we have. Um, just over the past weekend, uh, I've helped facilitate a workshop that Brother Wayne Chandler did. It was a Qigong workshop. Uh, it was like five hours long, you know, but um, I'm just listening and, and watching and seeing how we have this ability to move energy around in our bodies, to create and facilitate healing in ourselves. We don't have to go to a doctor to do this. But what we do customarily is something hurts. And the first thing we do is we go to the doctor and we ask the doctor what's wrong. And we ask the doctor what's wrong because we don't know ourselves. And what we should be doing over the course of our lives is doing everything that we can to understand who we are and what we are. And so when we do that, we tap into that understanding, that knowledge and that energy that enables us to live a much better quality of life because we're not living according to what people tell us about ourselves. We're living according to what we know about ourselves. Knowledge is really key. And meditation and Qigong and, and yoga and, and some of those other things can really lead us into a place where we can be empowered, uh, we can be more sovereign. You know, while we have this conversation, there are some forces that play that are doing everything that they can to control our thoughts, to control our bodies, control our movements, to control our actions, and basic to, basically to program us according to their needs. You know, as, as consumers in this society, we're the greatest consumers on the planet. They love us. That's why they go through so much effort to sell us and to, to tell us about things that they want us to purchase because we do that. We empower them by channeling our resources into what gives them their power. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but did you see the Juneteenth ice cream? I can't hear you, brother. My bad. I had it. Uh, yeah. Uh, it on mute, but yeah, I, I, I saw that ridiculousness. And, yeah, uh, it, 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 I'm glad they pulled it from the shelves. But yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I didn't know that they were pulling it from the shelves, but that's just an example of how our culture and who we are gets appropriated. So they've taken the term Juneteenth and they put a trademark on it which basically means that they've taken something that is specific to us and have employed it for their own commercial purposes. So if somebody wants to use Juneteenth, now they got to go to the man to get permission to use it. There's a problem with that because Juneteenth ain't about them, it's about us. Indeed. And yeah, that's a that's a whole conversation uh, uh, about the history of, uh, of, of misappropriation and, and and trying to commercialize, uh, well, just off of everything, just, just that culture of commercializing everything, but more so commercializing African pain and mm -hmm. misery and death, you know, and, and profiting off of that. And so, but I'll save that for another another time so what i want to get into now is since you said that you're you're not originally from ohio what brought you to ohio um the one of the last assignments that that my father had uh was uh, a tour of duty um in the far east uh, they told us that he was going to thailand uh, actually, he went to Laos and he was involved in the dissemination of Agent Orange uh, was actually something that eventually uh, took his life because of him contracting Parkinson's. But when he got that assignment to go to Thailand, uh, we couldn't go with him. 
So uh, our grandparents lived in Maslin and Canton, Ohio. So we ended up coming back as a family without my father to Maslin, Ohio. And we stayed in Maslin for the year that he was in Thailand. Uh, and then when he came back, they assigned him to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in near Dayton, Ohio. And then my family moved to uh, to Fairborn, actually, as a suburb of Dayton that, that uh, the, the Air Force Base is located in. So the family was there in Fairborn, and I was in in Maslin. But that that's what brought us back to Ohio. Still muted. I'm trying to reduce the background right. uh, noise while you're talking. So, uh, so I, 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 I can kind of understand since you went to school for communications uh, in, in, and then you getting into radio uh, in terms of possible motivations. But can you tell us about your transition into radio uh, it, it itself and, and how has that journey been? Yeah. Uh, when I was at Washington High School uh, in Maslin, Ohio, uh, I was attending a school that had a television department. Uh, we actually broadcast the uh, football games, and many may or may not know that Maslin, Ohio, is actually the birthplace of high school football. So it's something that they take very seriously. Uh, the the Maslin uh, Canton high school football rivalry is the whole oldest rivalry in the nation. So uh, I just went to a historic school and as a result, I got to participate in broadcasting. Uh, in the mornings, I read the morning announcements over the PA system. It was a the show that they called Accent. So every morning I would get on and whatever the announcements were, I would deliver that. So when I left Washington High School, I went to Kent State University and I decided that I wanted to go into broadcasting and I really wanted to be a television uh, news anchor. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to look at it, it didn't happen. But uh, that was that was the transition into radio. Uh, I lived in California for a, a season before we came to Maslin and um, I tried my hand at high school football and it didn't work out for me because I was just a, this little guy. And I guess I just didn't have enough heart to take hits from cats that weighed three and 400 pounds. And I was all of a buck 35. So my, uh, my head sent me into speech and speaking competitions. So I focused on speech. I left athletics. And um, as a result of my high school experience, I got to Kent state. I got um, opportunities to work in radio. There is um, a local news, uh, news guy's name is Wayne Dawson and he has been on the morning news on the Fox affiliate here in Cleveland ever since he left Kent State University in 1979. So um, I was fortunate to get his radio job when he left Kent and then I parlayed that into the job that I got in Akron and then I moved to Cleveland and I worked at um, WJMO radio which was a uh, black station or at least a black formatted station and then I worked at another radio station, which was an all news station, WERE. And uh, so that I worked in radio news for that those eight years. And then uh, after I left the radio station, I continued to do radio related projects. I used to do um, a program called Reflections, a moment in music history. It was syndicated and it was sponsored by the Ohio Lottery Commission. So um, I was doing these two minute programs about music artists. So I do a program about the spinners and I would have one minute of copy and then they would sandwich a 30 second lottery spot. And then I would come back and um, do the last 30 seconds of the program. And those programs were airing in Cleveland and Columbus and Cincinnati, Dayton, Youngstown, Toledo basically the major metropolitan uh, areas where there were black folks and, and black radio formats. But uh, long story short, uh, that that's how I got into radio and, um, and I still do radio. So now I do two different shows, uh, one of which you have been on, a 360 Info Network show that airs on AM 1490 WERE. And when we put our heads together, I'm gonna have you on the other show 
that airs on 95.9 FM WOBU. It's a community radio station. It's it's community based. And uh, we can talk about things that relate to black people without apology. Indeed. And I look forward to it. That's uh, I love community radio. I used to be a part of uh, KPFT in Houston, Texas, when I was there, which is a, a community radio. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people don't really understand how important media is and to be able to to have these deep and meaningful com conversations and the importance of being able to share your story and to share your experiences and to communicate with your people, you know, using these different types of mediums and technologies. So, you know, in from your perspective, you know, like what is the importance? Why does this matter in the, in the grander scheme of things? And, 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 and how and why do you continue to, to, to fight and participate in uh, uh, black media? Yeah, I, I kind of look at it as counterintelligence because the media is being used to push a narrative, to push an agenda, to influence thought and behavior. And it, it, um, it disseminates a lot of misinformation, a lot of things that aren't true. You know, many times what they tell you is the exact opposite of reality. So in order to counteract that, we have to tell our stories. You know, it, it, it's, when you, when you look at who we are as a people, we come from an oral tradition, an oral tradition. That means that information is being passed down through speech, through somebody talking to somebody else, through somebody sharing a story that we can pull messages and information and lessons from that. So either we're going to get their version of the truth or we're going to give our version of the truth. So that's why it's important for us to do the kinds of things that we're doing right now so people can hear something other than what they're being told. You know, uh, the show that we do uh, on WERE, it usually begins with what you do for yourself depends on what you think of yourself. What you think of yourself depends on what you know of yourself. And what you know of yourself depends on what you have been told. So there are a lot of people walking around in this country, in this city, in this community with negative perceptions of themselves because they have been told negative things about themselves. You know, we kind of use the term kings and queens loosely, you know, because not everybody was a queen, not everybody was a king. But conceptually, if you look at yourself with the esteem that it takes to be a king or a queen, you can push yourself towards success in life. You know, I, I look back at um, some of the ways that that our elders have 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 uh, facilitated conversations with us uh, younger folks, and sometimes they would say, "Oh, you ain't never gonna be nothing. You never amount to anything." And then that becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. They think that if they tell you that, it will motivate you to do great things, and it does exactly the opposite because they keep telling you that and then you believe it and then you fulfill it. So what we should be doing is cultivating the greatness that exists when, within everyone when they discover who they really are. You know, when you have the understanding that you, for instance, have my brother, I mean, just the name itself. When you said, I saw Imhotep, and then you connected with what that represents with you as a person, uh, you know, it empowers you to take things to the next level. You ain't Pookie. You ain't Bobby. You know, you ain't Ray Ray. You know, you are Sar Imhotep. Now, what I know about us, uh, Imhotep is that Imhotep was proficient in so many different things. And people look at you and say that it's impossible. How can you do this? And how can you do that? And how can you do that? And how can you do that? Because they want to put you into this box and limit you to that one thing. But the truth of the matter is you are a multidimensional being. And when you embrace your multidimensionality and you live within it, then you can achieve great things. So you can design a pyramid. 
you can you can create what became known as the Pythagorean theory because you created it. Yeah, we'll, we'll accept the fact that it got hijacked by the Greeks and Pythagoras, but the truth, the truth is that Imhotep created that. And now the world experiences the benefit of folks employing that theory. So we have to expand our self-knowledge. We have to expand our self-awareness and our culture. And this is, this is why what you do is so beautiful. Our culture is what enables us to have that understanding. So you live within the full knowledge of who Imhotep was. And then we can move over to Asar because Asar is, is I mean, how do you get greater than that? Understanding Asar, understanding Aset, understanding Heru, you know, that is the thing that got hijacked that pulled us away from our power because of our frame of reference. We always go to what was given to us versus where things began. When we understand the original, when we understand the original prototype and we relate to that, then we can understand the deficiencies of some of the carbon copies. I hope that makes sense. Indeed it does. And uh, I have two computers here. So one of them the mic is feedback into the yeah other. i think what you have to do is you have to mute the sound on the other computer uh uh i have uh but what i didn't realize is that there's a i just need to find the internal mic because normally when i use this other computer mm -hmm. i attach a uh, i either have a separate mic that i hook up to it or i have the uh what do you call it the the webcam and it has its own mic Right. So I forgot that there's a there's a there's a mic attached to the it's not a laptop it's just a just kind of a little mini PC yeah so it has its own mic and so I have to find where it is and turn it off okay you know before so uh, that's neither here nor there we're good mm -hmm. uh, now and so is there you know if you can recall on the spot some some unique history about Ohio that those of us you know need to know like what are some good examples of either resistance you know excellence you know possibilities what what is what is something that you've learned about the area that those of us may not uh, know of who, who who don't live in in Ohio? Um, my uh, father uh, lived most of his early life in Chillicothe, Ohio, <clears throat> and in Chillicothe, uh, there is a, a stretch of highway, and on both sides of this highway, there are these prisons. So the uh, Chillicothe Correctional Institute, the Ross County Correctional Institute, they're there. But in the vicinity of those prisons are also these mounds. Our brother, uh, Kaba Hiawatha Kamani, has knowledge about these mounds and their relationship to uh, pyramids. And it's supposed to be a very uh, spiritually implicated place in, in, in our country, actually. So that's that's one of those untold things about our state. Many people don't know about the significance of those mounds, but they have historical implications and they have uh, implications that are related to the indigenous people of this country. Um, then there are other things about um, Ohio, specifically the Cleveland area, uh, our proximity to the lake and other things that, that make this a highly spiritual place. Uh, I am in contact with uh, one of the uh, light workers who, uh, who is local, and she has entertained thoughts about going other places in the world, but she says that there is something extremely significant about Cleveland and, again, about our, our nearness to that lake. You know about that that pool of water that's at Abu Simbel, 
where you have those those four figures that are like carved into the side of of that mountain so to speak yeah and and the significance of that 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 pool of water that is and i, I my memory is escaping me about the the uh the, the divine feminine that is attached to it. Mm -hmm. But that body of water has a very significant relevance to life. Uh, and so when I think about that pool of water there, I think about this lake that we live next to. It's one of the largest freshwater lakes in the world, you know? And as America continues to go through what it's going through, there are predictions about things that will take place. Like they're saying that at some point, Miami's gonna be underwater. They're saying that there are issues with California, you know, where it is, you know, the fault lines and whatnot, and there may be earthquakes and who knows, you know, all that expensive real estate in California, you know, it may be underwater someday. I you think know, California just gonna fall off. Just gonna fall uh, off. Yeah, I'm sorry to tell you. Yeah. So, you know, um, there is something special about uh, Ohio. You know, it, it's kind of funny, brother. You know, I, I've had thoughts about leaving. You know, at one point I, I was thinking about going to uh, Atlanta to live. You know, uh, you, everybody entertains that whole notion of being successful in New York or being successful in L.A. or whatever. I've been to New York. I've been to California. You know, I've been to Florida. There's a whole lot of people in California. And who wants to spend two hours one way in traffic to get to work and two hours to get back? That just, that doesn't appeal to me. Uh, in the same way, you know, being in New York and dealing with all that and to take it to the continent, who wants to be in Accra where you have the same issues and jacked up roads? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I can remember going from Accra to uh, Atonkwa, which is my home village in Ghana. And, uh, and I'm riding with Nana Adulkwa and Nana saying, okay, well, we got to get up at four o'clock in the morning to be on the road by five o'clock, because if we're not on the road by five o'clock, we won't get out of Accra until, you know, nine or 10 o'clock just because the traffic is so bad. So that's a long winded way of saying that, you know, there's something special about Cleveland and, and that's the reason that I've stayed. I'll be transparent with you though and then let you know that I do entertain thoughts of, of moving to the continent. I just gotta figure out where I want to live and, and what's most conducive to my current mind state because you know we had the year of return in 2019 and we brought over a billion dollars to uh to Africa and and we literally brought millions of of Africans from the diaspora back and then the rona hit and now all of a sudden things have come to a screeching halt and now we got all these conditions well you got to do this you got to do that if you want to come to our country and th then these are strings that are being pulled by the colonial powers and nobody wants to they they don't want to address that you know why is it that Haiti, Haiti is still paying repar reparations to France? That makes no sense. You know, why is Haiti the poorest black country on this side of the planet while the French continue to, to fill their pockets? There's, there's something criminal about that. So I don't know. I, you know, I, I, uh, I really do like the idea of living in Africa. I've been there several times and you know, there, there are folks who are living in ignorance about it, you know, but I ain't ignorant about it. And then I know that, you know, people complain, well, the power goes out. Well, guess what? The power goes out here too. You know, my inter my internet gets interrupted at least once or twice an hour, you know, but you just deal with it and you move on. So there's, there's, there's more to life than life here. I'll say that. And, and at hopefully at some point, um, I'll be living there full time and, and I can say goodbye to America. Well, before uh, you leave the country and you leave this, uh, this interview, uh, I have to talk about your musical aptitude and, and your interest in piano. 
and 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 jazz and the like. So what what is where is that beginning? You know, and what was that process? And and, and what do you do with it now? Yeah. Well, you know, um, I think it's partly genetic. Um, my father played a little piano. He didn't play a lot. I may have heard him play piano in life three or four times. But I know that it was something that was in him. And my mother, uh, she's still with us. She was a drummer in the Maslin Washington High School swing band, uh, the marching band. And they, they, they like the football counterparts. Uh, they had a lot of notoriety. You know, when I was in high school, the uh, Maslin Tiger marching swing band actually performed in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. So um, when I was six years old, I started playing. I think I wrote my first song when I was six and my parents recognized that there was a musical talent there. So they hooked me up with a teacher whose name was Dr. Small, by the way. <laughs> How's that for a coincidence? Um, but um, yeah, so they they got me lessons and I did the recital thing. And then off and on as I was going through elementary school and junior high school and high school, uh, I took lessons here and there. And then when I got to college, uh, I just kind of immersed myself in teaching myself. So, you know, I was at Kent State and I was a DJ and I was hosting parties and all that. But, you know, there were times when everybody was at the party and I was at the dorm playing the piano until one or two o'clock in the morning. So I stayed with that. I graduated from college. Uh, and I think it was probably somewhere around 1986 or so. I bought this little Yamaha keyboard because I didn't have a piano in my house. And then I kind of got back into playing music. And then 10 years later, uh, I started a, a spoken word event at a coffee house in the Greenlight Shopping Center in Cleveland, Ohio. And that's when the first band was born. So a brother by the name of Kevin Conwell, who is now uh, my councilman, as a matter of fact, um, he was my first drummer. I conscripted a, a person who was in another group called Horns and Things who played bass. And that was the beginning of my uh, musical journey as uh, as a band leader and as someone who performs music in different places. Um, I uh, was introduced to jazz by Brother Okanta. I sat with him one one night and, you know, we uh, were listening to Arthur Blythe and Sonny Rollins and Cold Train. And, you know, back then, and this was this was in the, the uh, mid 70s, I was stuck on the funk. You know, it was, it was Parliament Funkadelic. It was cameo you know was the gap band i was into the funk but uh you know we we sat down and he started playing the music and it kind of opened my mind and so i went home for um christmas break and uh one of my partners who was uh one of the djs on my staff at the wksr the campus radio station he told me about this place in cincinnati called everybody's records so I drove all the way to Cincinnati from Chillicothe. I went to this record store and they had jazz albums for a dollar. So I walked out of everybody's records with about 50 albums, names of people that I didn't even know. But I took my albums home and I didn't lock the door, but I was in my room and I was just listening to jazz, man. And, and after that, that's all she wrote, you know. So now I'm a jazz head and I'm still a jazz head. Indeed, indeed. And for those of you who are listening, we are here with Brother Vince Robinson. This is the Cleveland All-Stars Week, and we are interviewing a series of all-stars from the Cleveland, Ohio area. So if you are loving this interview, you are digging the information that is being shared about his life and the area that is uh, Cleveland, Ohio. I need each and every one of you to that is right. I'm gonna need y'all to hit the like. 
like button and, you know, help us uh, towards that uh, 10,000 subscriber subscription uh, process and hit the bell so that you can get uh, the notices when we have these live conversations as well as any kind of uh, uploaded videos and the like. And uh, so, yeah, for me, you know, because I'm, uh, I'm a, a bit younger, of course, uh, for you, you know, my introduction to jazz was, of course, just like most people, it, it's uh, uh, the parents, you know, like this would be played in the house. And, you know, because uh, we grew up kind of ultra conservative Christian and, you know, this is, you know, in the 80s, it's 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 hip hop. Hip hop is, is, is what's emerging and what's uh, ruling at the time. And, and, you know, in the early 80s, it was more so, you know, the 808s. It's a lot of, you know, electronic scratching and stuff like that. It wasn't no real, it wasn't really full sounds unless they were sampling, of course, from the funk era uh, in, in the 70s. But like when you get to like 86, 87, and you have Rakim, uh, you know, Eric B. and Rakim, and they're introducing the jazz, you know, into the hip hop. And then a little bit later on with the Pete Rock and CL Smooth, Pete Rock, he was produced. And then, of course, a tribe called Quest. Gangstar. You know, Gangstar and uh, even, you know, Diggable Planets and all that. So transitioning that late 80s, early 90s. You know, you, I had a new appreciation for it because now I'm trying to figure out, OK, where are they getting the samples from? I need to hear the whole thing. And I think, you know, that's one of the the, the benefits of, of hip hop, especially in that golden era, is that it kept the names alive. It, it, it kept the, 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 the music alive. People want to know more about, you know, these these artists who, who produce these particular works and. And so, you know, are, are we ever going to see like a, a live concert, you know, from you uh, in the near future? Yeah, I think that that's a definite possibility. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, we did a live concert from Kent State University uh, a few months ago. It was myself and, and Brother Okanta and a violinist. And he did, um, he's got this epic poem for a shake onto joke mm. so i wrote some music for it and the violinist very gifted violinist she just vibed with me man so mm. it was it was live it was live streamed and uh and it's on my youtube channel you know i'm not where you are in terms of subscribers because i'm not on you and i'm not saying that you're doing this but some mm. folks are on youtube chasing dollars i ain't chasing dollars <laughs> on youtube i'm just putting my stuff out there for those who want to see it but um, but it's there. Um, I wanted to address a, a comment that came up from Amateur Scholar, and he was asking if I thought music is too digitized today, no more live instruments. Uh, you talked about the 80s, and I think the 80s was really the tipping point when we went from live instrumentation into electronic instruments because they discovered that they could program drum beats they had synthesizers that could create all the different sounds. And if you could do everything out of a couple of digital instruments, then you didn't need people. So yeah. the music became more producer driven and less musician driven. And, and then you had hip hop come and it was two turntables and a microphone. So you just <laughs> eliminated the band altogether. But now you look at cats like Jay-Z and others, they do their performance they have live instrumentation. So you've seen a resurgence of musicianship. And then, you know, just look around. You know, we, we have conversations about uh, the dearth of quality music on uh, terrestrial radio. And the, the truth of the matter is there are entities out there that are forcing people to pay to get their music heard and not everybody can afford, you know, 100,000, 200,000 to get their record played and then there's the other aspect, and that is that they don't want conscious music being proliferated because it will wake folks up and then they'll have a revolution on their hands. So there are a lot of reasons that we're not hearing that music. But in all of these different places, we have musicians who are creating and who are playing. 
So that's one of the real reasons that it's so important for us to support local talent and to value local talent. You know, we'll pay a hundred dollars, a hundred fifty dollars per person to see Jay Z at the big arena. But then you have somebody in Cleveland who who is a musician and is equally talent and talented in terms of musicianship, and we it's it's a hard thing for us to pull ten dollars out the pocket. You know. We, we have to support and we have to embrace those of us who are doing what we do because we have a, a consciousness that's not being reflected in, in popular music. But, you know, in terms of, of analog dirt versus digital, you know, it was Erica Badu that said that she was an analog girl in a digital world. And I, I think there's some merit to us staying connected to the analog paradigm. Um, Back in the day, probably about eight or nine years ago, I was immersed in the world of Bobby Hemet. And, and Bobby Hemet used to talk about the value of playing albums because he related that black wax, somehow he connected it to melanin. And he talked about the needle being a diamond and the diamond, that stylus on the groove and the, and the vibrations that came out of that and the way it comes out of your system and it it was it's a warmer sound than what you get from the digital music that we get today so there's definite value in analog versus digital and there's definite value in acoustic over amplified you know i remember years ago it's probably 1981 i was in israel in demona and you may know of the, the, the significance of Demona. But I was in Demona. I'm in this room. These three sisters are singing. And their voices were so pure. And they were the, the sound was just bouncing off the wall. And the quality of the sound emanating from them just sent chills through me. Simil similar to the chill that I felt, and I know you can appreciate this, similar to the chill that I felt when I was driving down Desert Highway in Cairo and I looked over to my left and I saw the top of the Great Pyramid of Giza and it just sent a chill through me. It was the same feeling, you know, there's just something powerful about that. But there's something powerful that comes from hearing music in its purest form. So, you know, I have a $4,000 keyboard and I have a $2,000 piano. And I prefer what's coming out of that piano to what's coming out of that $4,000 keyboard. Even though the, the, the sound coming out of that keyboard, it doesn't require the piano to be tuned. It's going to be perfect every time. And my piano has not been tuned in 15 years. I'm ashamed to say that it's true. Hasn't been tuned in 15 years. But when I hit that key and the key brings the hammer back and it strikes that string and that string starts vibrating and the sound comes off of it, it has a therapeutic effect for me. There are times when I actually engage in meditation at the piano, just creating sounds, creating music, creating that vibration and then letting it. It, I'm bathing in the vibration that comes off of that instrument. And it's something to me, at least, could, perhaps it's just mental for me, but it's extremely edifying. It just speaks to the value of music. Indeed. And, you know, uh, my dad, you know, uh, played in the, the church band. So we would have all kinds of instruments at the house. He, he, mainly played the drums for church but he also did keys um he he grew up so you know he's from new orleans and so you know it's 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 tubas trombones horns you know they they get down of course the xylophone and you know our our family is kind of critical in the the, the birth and and popularity of zydeco out of uh, Appaloosas, you know, Louisiana and the like. And so, you know, I grew up with all of this, but of course I'm a hip hop head. So, 
you know, uh, uh, I gravitated more, at least in the early days, to 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 the hip hop culture and things. And but because of, of of that, I used to DJ and produce music. And of course, I would like all of because you know, you know, down south, it's about the bass, and you know, bass is 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 key. So that that sonic, it, you you can't imitate that even on live uh, instruments. But there's certain textures that we would always try to sample because you just couldn't get it simply, you know, trying to play them on the, on the digital keys or like that. So we like we would even sample the crackling and the like of the vinyl, you know, as it plays so that, you know, it, it can be like a, a part of the backdrop, you know, of the of the, the production. It's just a certain type of texture that you get with like live voices. You know, even if you're just sampling those, that just brings, you know, it all together. So, but, you know, I understand completely, you know, what you mean about the live instrumentation. Uh, and and there's, there's nothing like it. And I think maybe to an extent, uh, the pandemic, I would think, uh, would, would have garnered an appreciation for that because everybody was so locked up and being in that you wanted to go out and see a live concert, be around live things. And, you know, and of course, like when you are doing even a hip hop concert, that's why a lot of, you know, and I live in Philly, so this is home of the roots, you know, the live hip hop band, uh, you, you, you want to have that element there, you know, uh, and not simply just a DJ just playing, you know, uh, records. Uh, so I think, you know, like with, with hip hop culture, it's a good blend because, you know, you can you can pretty much do anything and use any sound. And uh, so, you know, uh, but yeah, nothing like live instrumentation, being at a live concert, no matter what the genre is and, and just hearing those 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 sonics uh, from the live instrumentation. But um we're getting ready to wrap up here. Uh, and I know, you know, you're a busy man and we could talk forever, but, uh, you know, before you go, you know, how can people get to know more about you? Where can they go? And, you know, where can they catch your, your own, uh, conversations and live interviews, uh, if they're not in the local, uh, Cleveland area? Yeah. I would say the best point of connection is uh, Facebook because I post most of what I, I do on Facebook. There are a bunch of Vince Robinsons on Facebook. I'm Vince Robinson 18 uh, and it'll say Kent State. So if you put in Vince Robinson, Kent State, it'll probably take you to my page. I do have an Instagram uh, account. I use it every once in a while. You know, I haven't really mastered uh, social media, you know, some folks, they got a Twitter, they got an IG, they got Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat, all of that. I'm I'm not there yet. I'm going to have to go into that because I do understand the importance of connection. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel. Uh, and as I was saying before, I don't necessarily push folks to like and subscribe because I'm not doing it for monetization. I'm just doing it to proliferate quality information. I'll put it in those terms. But if you go to my YouTube channel, you will find podcasts of both radio shows. I do uh, virtual um, shows of the radio show sometimes. So when we do your uh, radio show, we'll do it using StreamYard and it'll be just like you're doing it mm -hmm. without the fancy intro until I learn how to do that. We, um, but we got to get you an intro. We gotta, yeah. Yeah. Gotta I got to get, get that together, man. You know, <laughs> I know it means something. And uh, again, I was extremely impressed with it. But yeah, Facebook um, and YouTube and Instagram, those are probably the best ways. I'm Vince Dot Robinson on Instagram and Vince Robinson on uh, YouTube and Vince Robinson on Facebook. Indeed. Indeed. And is there anything, any kind of closing words that you want to give uh, our audience before you, before you leave? Yeah, um, you know, when I close the shows, uh, and this came to me a few years back, but, you know, my mantra is know yourself, love yourself, be yourself. And when you know yourself, 
that's uh it's really a, a a short way of saying a concise way of saying no god because if you know yourself you know god self represents god within us you know i learned this from dr james brown and not the musician but local brother who was <laughs> actually in asara set <laughs> ironically but um but you know we we talk about the self and the not self and the not self is that ego part that that the, the part that's out in the world the part that has all those emotions that are tied to being human the self is your connection with god it's that voice in you that says hey you know bro that ain't right you know it, it's it's that 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 conscious conscience that lives within you so know yourself love yourself because if you don't love you why would you expect someone else to love you and then be yourself you know live within the beauty that is you you know that's one number two and uh, i could probably do more of it and and i think we do probably do it and not realize that we're doing it but i can't overstate the importance of meditation i can't overstate the importance of tuning out all the chaos and confusion in the world because there's a whole bunch of stuff going on that you have absolutely no control over you know i mean i know they're fighting a the war over in europe you know the way that it affects me is when i pull up to the bp station i'm paying four and a half dollars for a gallon of gas that's you know but on my end of things then what do i have to do to make sure that i have enough money to pay for the gas you know so you can you can be affected by those things but you can also create ways that you can survive in the midst of all of that so you know live in your purpose that's that's number three live in your purpose and if you don't know what your purpose is find out and then when you find out live in it you know my brother you're a linguist man you know you understand things about language that folks are they're oblivious to and because you have that understanding it empowers you because you know the importance of language that means because of your awareness you're not going to say the wrong thing because saying the wrong thing could injure you you're going to say the right thing so that you can protect your interests and you can protect the interests of others and because you have this awareness and you have this knowledge you can live within your purpose and positively impact the lives of others the reason that we exist we all have different skills talent knowledge understanding awareness or whatever we all have those different things and when we use those things we are in a position to provide a benefit to others because there's interconnectedness within our human family and when everybody functions within their purpose then we all win but if we walk around not knowing what we're supposed to do then we'll have somebody telling us to do something that we ain't supposed to be doing and what comes out of something that you ain't supposed to be doing not good most of the time it's bad you know if somebody gets you addicted to drugs you're doing something that you're not supposed to be doing so what happens with your life not a whole lot you're not living in your purpose you're suiting their purpose because they're selling you the drugs that's making you rich and making you dysfunctional so live in your purpose know yourself love yourself and be yourself and i'll and i'll leave it there excellent 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 and th these are words that i live by uh myself and, and it's always nice to hear it echo you know and in another representation of yourself meaning you know other people in the community yes and so uh again folks this is this is cleveland all-star week for a reason and I, I, again, I'm very honored to have you, you know, on the program to to you know share a little bit of your time. And I know that's you know our most precious commodity, so I don't take this lightly. You know, you sitting here having a conversation with us, and uh, can't wait to have you back and and to be on the the other station that you mentioned uh, earlier uh, to continue this conversation and keep you know expanding the minds uh, of people in our network. And, and so, as I say on this channel, my network is your network. So, you know, introducing uh, Brother Vince Robinson, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, 
you know, author, producer, you know, host, and musician. And uh, the All Star Week continues on Thursday. Uh, but for those of you who are, you know, Patreon members, we will be having a live conversation with uh, Ah Um Kim Sama, who is a, a you know doctor and you know Pan African historian, metaphysician and the like, uh, as well out of South Africa. So we'll be interviewing him live in South Africa. So it'll be 4 p.m. South Africa time for those of you who are in South Africa, and it'll be 10 a.m. Eastern time for those of you uh, here in the United States. And so that conversation will be live for the Patreon members, and then we'll share it, you know, publicly, uh, you know, sometime in the, in, the, in the near future. But as mentioned earlier, I don't have the, the flyer up here. Actually, since I'm on this computer, I can upload it real quick. So let me just do that because that's what technology allows for us to do uh, on the fly. And here we go. So at 6 p.m. on uh, this coming Thursday, the 26th, also out of Cleveland, Ohio, is uh, Tony F. Sias, you know, who is uh, the director, I mean, the CEO and president of the Karamu House or Caribou House. And uh, he is a uh, theater director as well as an a actor and playwright. So, you know, we'll be getting into this aspect of telling our stories uh, on, on Thursday with him. And then, of course, we, we discuss Sister Ladosha uh, Wright. And, you know, she's a friend of the, of the, of the channel, but, you know, she is a, a very dynamic woman. A very large list of interests and accomplishments and things that she's doing. So we'll get into all of that and more at 8 p.m. on Thursday. So 6 and 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time on Thursday. We continue the Cleveland uh, All Stars Week. And so I want to say thank you, thank you again uh, for coming on the program. And I will see the rest of you all later. Peace.